So welcome everybody to the Oxford Psychedelic Society. My name is Ali Reza Omidvar, and I'm the event manager at the Oxford Psychedelic Society. Today's event is exploring unexplained psychedelic phenomena, a conversation between a parapsychologist and a skeptic, Michael Sherman and David Luke. So before we introduce uh, the biography of the speakers, I just have to um, do some housekeeping. If you would like to donate to our society, all our events are free, but you can donate to OXPSYSOC, that's PayPal. And so after that, we can uh, go to David Luke. Dave, Dr. David Luke is a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Greenwich, which he has been teaching an undergraduate course on the psychology of exceptional human experience since 2009, and also honorary senior lecturer at the Center of Psychedelic Research, Imperial College. His research, his research focuses on transpersonal experiences, anomalous phenomena, and altered states of consciousness, especially via psychedelics. Having published more than 100 academic papers in this area, including 10 books, most recently, Other Worlds, Psychedelics and Exceptional Human Experience. He directs the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Salon at the Institute of Ecotechnics, London, and is the co-founder and director of Breaking Convention, International Conference on Psychedelic Consciousness. He has given over 300 invited public lectures and conference presentations, won teaching, research and writing awards, organized numerous festivals, conferences, symposia, seminars, retreats, expedition, pagan cabarets, and pilgrimages. <laughs> we go to Dr. Michael Sherman. He's the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, the host of the, post, the podcast of Michael Sherman Show, and a presidential fellow at Chapman University, where he teaches Skepticism 101. For 18 years, he was a monthly columnist for Scientific American. He is the author of New York Times bestseller, Why People Believe Weird Things, and The Believing Brain, Why Darwin Matters, The Science of Good and Evil, The Moral Arc, Heavens on Earth, Giving the Devil His Due, Reflections of a Scientific Humanist. Dr. Sherma was the co-host and co-producer of the 13-hour family channel te television series, Exploring the Unknown. His two TED Talks, seen by millions, were voted in the top 100. Dr. Sherman received his BA in psychology from Pepperdine University, MA in experimental psychology from California State University, and his PhD in the history of science from Claremont Graduate University. So thank you everyone for joining us. The structure for today's event is first, both of the speakers providing some background information to what they do and why they're doing it. And then we move on to David Luke providing a presentation of his field work, his study, and his uh, significant research conclusions. Then we move on to Michael providing any rebuttals, asking questions, or simply provi providing a presentation if you would like to. Then we move to uh, two concluding statements, one from David Luke and also for Michael Sherman. And then we open up to audience discussion, audience questions um, at 9.35 p.m. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here. Hi, Michael, first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming along and, and uh, joining in this discussion. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, have you here and uh, I don't think we've had the pleasure of meeting yet, so I'm looking forward to this. No, Although I have nice no to you. Patients. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'll just give you a bit of a preamble ramble off the cuff uh, about how I got into this, I think. Um, I guess it probably started off by just having an inherent interest in altered states from a very young age. Uh, I seem to have a proclivity for getting in altered states and also for skiving off school and going down to the secondhand bookshops and reading all the kind of, kind of alternative left field science and anything I could get my hands on by way of uh, the occult or anything other than going to school really. Uh, which led me into kind of dabbling with my brain like a neurochemistry playset as, as a young teenager and uh, striking up an interest in, in psychedelics quite early on. 
um, which then led me to going away and trying to study about the, the nature of the psychedelic experience. I did a degree in psychology, um, learned pretty much nothing about the psychedelic experience after three years because they don't really teach much about that uh, on a psychology degree, unfortunately, uh, even though it is part of the human experience. Um, and so I kind of ran screaming from the academy uh, as, as fast as I could. Uh, unfortunately, my, my grandfather uh, had called me up just before I left, uh, but I just I'd finished my degree and he was like, I've got a really good idea for you for a PhD. And I was like, no way, I'm not ever doing a PhD. You've got to be joking. He was 97 at the time. And he had this idea about something to do with luck, fate and the spiritual experience. Uh, but I was, you know, I was just kind of heading out the door. I was like, look, I'm, I'm going to be up your way in about a week or two. I'll, I'll come around and you can tell me all about it. Uh, and of course, he then promptly died about a week later. So I never got to find out what his ideas were other than those three words. Uh, and that kind of like haunted me for a while. I mean, I, I went away just traveling. I went to Mexico uh, after a kind of flash of inspiration on a train. I needed to go to Mexico and study shamanism, uh, uh, even though I didn't know anything about Mexico at the time or shamanism for that matter. Um, and uh, so off I went. And after about 18 months in Mexico, uh, I happened to have eaten some peyote and I had a kind of inspiration that I needed to go back and, and do this PhD. Uh, which I which I then did, uh, which took me a rather long time, uh, and ultimately finished it. I don't know if I ever found out what he was really talking about, uh, but there was lots of interesting synchronicities in, with him involved um, in the study of that. And I did it through the lens of parapsychology, actually. So that was when I committed my first act of career suicide uh, by getting into parapsychology. And I, I did that as much as anything because you couldn't study psychedelics uh, at that time, uh, the PhD in the UK, there was just no one to supervise you. Parapsychology was the kind of least, less controversial option of the two. I wanted to study psychedelics. Now that's completely flipped 180 and, and, and parapsychology is still taboo and psychedelics are a kind of red hot button uh, topic. So uh, that's kind of what got me into it. And so I've been kind of studying the intersection between parapsychology and, and psychedelics for my entire career really, uh, if you include the truanting and the teenage experimentation as well, uh, you know, before my career. Uh, and so my career has led me to do various experimental research, everything from kind of autoethnography, ethnography, uh, survey research, clinical work, cognitive neuroscience, everything from the hard end of the spectrum to the very soft, squishy, sorry to any anthropologist in here, ethnographic end of, of the spectrum of trying to understand anomalous or exceptional experiences and all states of consciousness more generally. But I'll, I think I'll pretty much leave it there and hand it over to Michael. All right. Well, that was very interesting. My, my life journey is rather different. <laughs> I've never taken psychedelics, peyote, ayahuasca, DMT, None of that. I'm, I, as the kids say, I have a pretty vanilla life in that regard. Um, although I have had some out of body and uh, quirky anomalous experiences from sleep deprivation and sensory deprivation tanks that I've tried, because those are drug free and legal. And uh, <clears throat> I've written about my alien abduction experience I had while I was riding a bike in Race Across America, I'd gone 83 hours and ridden about 1,280 miles uh, from uh, the, the Pacific Ocean, Santa Monica, California, all the way into Nebraska. I'd just uh, ridden nonstop, and uh, I had this fantastic alien abduction experience, um, which at the time was very powerful. And uh, uh, you, you have to know something about this race. It's a nonstop a transcontinental bike race for 3,000 miles, LA to New York at the time. And uh, everyone uh, is uh, has a support team that follows behind them. So in my case, um, the, the the spaceship that came up to abduct me was actually just my motorhome with my support crew. But at the time, I, I had this um, memory, apparently deep in my brain, of this TV show from the early 1960s called uh, The Invaders, uh, starring this uh, actor named Roy Thinnis. About it was a body snatching type show in which the aliens had come to earth and they were taking over people's bodies 
And they looked just like your friends and neighbors and family members, except they had a stiff little finger. For some reason, they could traverse the vast instances of interstellar space, but couldn't quite get, after all the DNA uh, uh, and cloning uh, technology, they couldn't quite get the tendons in the little finger. Anyway, that was the kind of the plot uh, narrative um, tool to, to, for, for people to figure out who the aliens were. And that's what I thought. At the side of the road, these people are alien body snatchers, and I'm checking their little fingers. And I'm quizzing them like my bike mechanic, you know, because the aliens wouldn't know what kind of tires I'm using on my bike. Well, they did. And, you know, I talked, asked some personal questions of, of my girlfriend and the aliens even knew that. So I thought, man, these aliens really did their homework. Right. So then, you know, I took a, a 90 minute, it might have been a three hour sleep break and, and then it all went away. And uh, you can actually watch me talking about this to the ABC television crew, Wild World of Sports, who was record, uh, filming the, show, the race. And, and I'm explaining to Eric Hyden there on the bike, you know, what happened to me the night before. So if you type in Michael Shermer comment, alien abductions, you'll see this. So that was very real. I get that. It, you know, these uh, anomalous psychological experiences that people have whatever the cause you know again a dmt or ayahuasca or, or a peyote or sleep deprivation or just stress um you know or loneliness you know we we know about um and i've written about in, in the believing brain a whole section of the research on uh sense presences you know people when they're alone particularly if they're um anxious tend to sense there's somebody else in the room with them uh or in the plane or on the boat or, you know, on the, I did a rod dog sled race on the sled. There's somebody there. They're just talking to them side of the road. There's, you know, some guy saw an orchestra on the side of the road in Alaska during the, I did a rod dog sled race. What, you know, this is all in his head. Right. <clears throat> but the experiences are very real. So I guess the question from an empirical scientific perspective is how do we distinguish between uh, realities that are entirely up here versus realities that are, also out there you know so people that have near-death experiences most of them think they actually went somewhere there's this other dimension this other place and they write very passionately about it it changed their lives um you know even alexander famously wrote that book uh, proof of heaven you know he's quite sure when he was in this medically induced coma that he went to heaven and he describes it and so on but when i read it and then I read accounts by uh, people like yourself or Oliver Sacks, who writes about hallucinations and, and tr wild trips that they take through artificial means. It, it's indistinguishable to me. They all sound the same. You know, the colors were incredibly intense. The, uh, the feeling of deep, deep love for the person, the, your friend or loved one that's with you, you know, and so on. And, and it's like, how can I tell the difference? How can an outsider tell the difference between it's all up here versus it's up here and it's also out there. That, that's the problem we face, I think. And I don't know the way around that. I don't know how you could test it. You know, because if your evidence, if, if I say, well, what's the evidence for this? And you go, well, Shermer, if you took the peyote, you'd see exactly what I saw. It's like, yeah, okay, but that's still up here, right? And you go, no, no, you're actually going someplace. It's like, well, how do I know I'm going someplace? Well, to try it and you'll see, you'll feel like you went someplace. And then, you know, the, the person over there on the right of the screen, maybe he's never tried it. And he says, how do I know it's real? Here, you try it. You know, and so how do we get around this trap? I don't know. I really don't. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> so I guess I'll, I'll maybe try and, and speak to that and, and my attempt to get, trying to get around this trap. So yeah, David, uh, you will be providing your presentation now. Um, is that okay? Yeah, if I can get my swipe to work. Four fingers, you say. Oh, I need to click. I haven't got enough fingers. That's the problem. Maybe my little fingers. Maybe the stiff. aliens can help. Yeah, no, I've been rumbled. Uh, my little pinky's giving me away, I'm afraid. Can we do it from presenter view? Sorry, sorry. Oh, presenter view. Yeah, actually, or just let's just do it in the edit mode because uh this is actually the wrong presentation <laughs> it, it turns out so okay. let's uh Ooh, it's a nice image, though. <laughs> thank you it seems yeah, like the wrong title it. Yeah. uh so i'm going to skip on i'd actually in in a bit of haste at the beginning sent the wrong uh presentation over so i'm just going to have to kind of freestyle it somewhat from here uh and i guess um, what brought me to this in, in my interest is was traveling through mexico and and attempting to study shamanism and you know, coming across people like the Waradika, otherwise known as the Wicholis, and they are part of a kind of ancient 
lineage of shamanistic, animistic kind of practitioners, it would seem as far back as we can tell, uh, you know, peyote has been found there in that region uh, in a ritual context, archaeologically dating back to at least five and a half thousand years. So it's a very ancient lineage of use of, of psychoactive plants in that part of the world. But, you know, if, if you were to kind of try and define shamanism, shamanism is just a a word that's been borrowed from the Tungus and used to apply to these particular magico spiritual practitioners, uh, we'd say that shamans uh, go into an altered state of consciousness at will in the name of their community to uh, transcend time and space and bring back useful information for their community uh, and communicate with the spirits of nature or whatever. So that's what they say they do. Uh, and often they do that by getting into other states, uh, sometimes through dancing or drumming or dreaming or diet, but also through what we might call drugs, what they might call plant allies or whatever, uh, psychedelics usually. And so the, 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 the Varadika, the Wicholis, make use of peyote cactus, uh, and they've been doing that for a very long time. Also in Mexico, we find the use of uh, mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, which is also found to be used around the world. Uh, in uh, Siberia and the Arctic North, we find the use of Amanita muscaria, this red and white spotted mushroom beloved of children's fairy tales. Uh, in India, we see the use of Dachora and also hashish. Uh, in Australia, Pachuri. In Africa, uh, Iboga. Uh, in Syria, maybe like Syrian rue, Paganum hamala. Uh, and maybe in the whole of the uh, Middle East and North Africa. And of course, in the Amazon, the use of uh, ayahuasca and various other psychoactive plants. Um, so this is a, a very ancient lineage. And in the West, we've pretty much only come across these substances in the last hundred years or so since. I mean, you could pretty much put a, a stick in the ground when this man here, Albert Hoffman, discovered uh, LSD or kind of rather invented it um, in about 1943. But when, when we find that all the first discoverers or inventors or explorers come across psychedelics, they all had their own paranormal-like experience. I say paranormal-like. Uh, so for instance, Albert Hoffman had an out-of-body experience, found himself floating above his body, thought he died, and you know all the rest of it on his first LSD experience. Uh, these two guys here, uh, Humphrey Osmond and John Smithies, uh, who came up with the, the doing the first psychedelic research to treat addictions. They, Humphrey Osmond himself came up with the word psychedelic, and they both believed in the first paper they published in 1953 that psychedelics give you access to these kind of psychic spaces of you know, transcending time and space and bringing about useful information. Uh, of course, Humphrey Osmond gave uh, mescaline to Aldous Huxley, the famous writer, and they coined this term psychedelic, and Huxley himself also believed that these psychedelics could give you access to these mystical or psychic realms. Uh, I'm gonna skip a few here. Uh, the first discovery of uh, psilocybin mushrooms by a, a Westerner um, was by Gordon and Valentina Wasson. They went to Mexico, to found these Mazatec indigenous people making use of psilocybin mushrooms. And um, they uh, ended up in a ceremony with this man, Don Arulio. Uh, even though it was five day donkey ride, up the side of a mountain to get there, Don Arulio took some mushrooms for them in a ceremony and then told them all these things about their son back home, uh, which they didn't know about, uh, which when turned out to be true when they got back to New York, uh, which you know, begs the question of how did he know? I don't think that was any kind of hot reading, for instance. Um, so ostensibly, you know, a demonstration of some kind of clairvoyance or precognition, ostensibly. Uh, they tried to analyze the, the mushrooms, uh, they ended up with various pharmaceutical companies, they, they ended up back in the lab, interestingly, of Albert Hoffman, uh, these mushrooms, about 10 years after he discovered LSD, he did the sensible thing, because they'd been testing on animals before that point to try and find the active alkaloids in the psilocybin mushrooms, he did a simple chromatography separation, he took the, the various alkaloids and gave them to his lab assistants, and he discovered psilocybin, uh, and he had this time a medical doctor with him because he was terrified that he was going to have a, another near-death experience and uh, it, what happened was even worse in a way because he saw the doctor coming at him uh, with a kind of resplendent like an Aztec priest resplendent with feathered headdress and instead of holding a stethoscope 
proffering a obsidian knife to cut out his being heart. Um, so not necessarily kind of anything paranormal there, but he did notice that when he gave people in Switzerland, in Basel, where the laboratory were, either psilocybin or, or, or mushrooms, even though they did not know the provenance of the mushrooms, they would often have experiences of an Aztec or Mayan nature, Maz Aztec uh, artwork or Aztec temples and pyramids and this kind of thing. And he suggested himself that there was somehow tuning into the consciousness of the original users. Um, so pretty much all the first psychedelic explorers and discoverers had their own kind of paranormal like uh, leanings and explanations for these these experiences they ensued. They started leaking out of the, the laboratories into the therapy rooms. People like Stanislav Groff started doing LSD assisted psychotherapy. Uh, he conducted over 4,000 sessions and he said he reported observing patients experiencing past life recall, out body experiences, ESP, accurate remote viewing and space time travel on a daily basis. This is kind of occupational hazard if you are a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy therapist. Um, so, and then of course they stopped getting used recreationally so-called by people like Danny the dealer here. And when people using them recreationally are surveyed, people report a very high degree of kind of psychic-like experiences such as telepathy, precognition, psychokinesis. Uh, telepathy usually in the majority of users have had an experience of telepathy whilst under the influence of some kind of psychedelic. And people who tend to use them uh, the more often they use them, the more often they report them. I also did a survey myself and found that um, if you compare them to non-psychedelic drugs, people don't tend to report experiences of telepathy on coffee or alcohol or crack or heroin. It's, re it's really something very specific to psychedelics. So of course, that's all anecdotes, right? We, you know, they're probably all off their mash on MDMA bongs or whatever, and so you can't necessarily you know, hold much testimony by, or much validation by someone's testimony because they could be suffering some kind of psychedelic induced delusion. So the only real way we can go beyond the anecdote is to look at controlled experimental studies of which there were some started in the 1960s and 70s using some high tech sophisticated parapsychology gadgetry uh, at the time, at least it was. Uh, and they were typically of this kind of Xenocard um, what's called forced choice design, where you're forced to choose one of five particular symbols. And they tended to do these experiments. It turns out there was a number of these experiments. Uh, this is obviously the 70s, judging by the hairdo, um, with people um, who'd never taken a psychedelic before. There's a number of these experiments. They were nearly always naive to psychedelics. They gave them very high doses. And then we'd get them to try and guess Xena cards for two or three hours. Right. And uh, of course, people tended to somewhat complain and said it was kind of psychedelically immoral to get them to do that in their first mystical rapture and so on. And those results of those experiments weren't very successful, but then they weren't well controlled either. Uh, and so ultimately, there were a number of uh, what's called free response experiments where you just get the person to describe their visual mental imagery attempting to identify some unknown target and it could be an object in a different room or a painting or the contents of a room or something like that and in those experiments they tended to be uh, a bit more successful uh, the majority of those experiments were had some modicum of success although again they weren't very well controlled enough control conditions there was no kind of sensory leakage and the, the, the probability estimates were terrible so all I can say is that on the evidence that was done of the research over the years, it was kind of promising perhaps of the possibility of some kind of uh, kind of information transfer through the use of psychedelics, but definitely nothing evidential. So I attempted to do my own research. Uh, I started off with ayahuasca, largely because the alkaloids identified in ayahuasca were called telepathy by the first chemist who isolated them on account of the number of explorers and a botanist who'd had their own telepathic, usually clairvoyant actually, clairvoyant like experiences, usually of visions of people uh, who are known to them or known to the other people in the, in the ceremony that had died that they didn't know about, but found out about whilst they were under the influence of the ayahuasca. That seemed to be a very common trope of people uh, having those experiences. Uh, so I did my first experience with ayahuasca. They're a bit of a disaster. I'm not gonna go into that. But that's uh, uh, but I used a very different test paradigm. But then eventually, uh, I also didn't like ayahuasca research because 
in the ceremonies I, that I managed to inveigle myself into to do my experiments, the people running the ceremonies would go, yeah, sure, you can do your experiment, but you also have to drink ayahuasca, uh, which made, A, doing the experiments quite difficult, and also I had a really kind of hellish existential time <laughs> as well. So I ended up switching to San Pedro cactus, which contains mescaline, which comes from a similar region in the Andes. Um, and I developed a free response um, kind of testing protocol. Uh, the first experiment, I was trying to get 20 participants. Uh, I couldn't actually get a shaman to agree to let me do the experiment. Uh, as soon as I pulled out my laptop, it'd say, you're gonna scare off all the spirits with your electromagnetic juju. And so that would kind of ended badly. And in the end, I, I opted to just, instead of doing 20 participants with one trial each, I thought if I get one participant and do all 20 trials, it's, it's more or less the same thing. And I did, and that was me. Uh, so I took uh, a large dose of mescaline and uh, did a kind of self-experimentation to kind of uh, proof of process. Um, and th this is the protocol. So it's a free response precognition design. So you're trying to access information from the future. There was 20 trials. Um, start off by taking some mescaline. Uh, and then once that kicks in, for each trial, I would do a four-step process. The first step is visualization. And that is I close my eyes. And with the intention of getting the future target, I just see what's in my mental imagery, right? And then that gets recorded. I make some notes about that, very brief notes. Then I would see four run, like uh, one minute video clips that were all heterogeneous, they're all different from each other. Um, and uh, I didn't know, I hadn't seen the video clips before and I didn't know what the target was, but one of them would be the target in the future, okay? Uh, so I'd see those four video clips I would rate them by how close they were to my visual mental imagery. And then that's called the voting process. And then finally, there'd be a verification. And that would, I would run a random number generator on the computer. And effectively, the random number generator would decide what the target was. So it's kind of very arbitrary, very independent, and it's being controlled like by purely probabilistic means. And so if you've got this kind of one in four possibility of actually getting the right target, which is 25%. Uh, I'm not going to I've got too much time to show you all the results other than I'll just show you the first one. This is the very first attempt. This is actually just a pilot trial to see if I could actually even function under that much mescaline. And the, what I wrote down was ancient Greek scene, eyes, city at night and a lake, and some note to myself about the visuals being a bit vague and too fluid to actually get anything concrete out of them. But that's what I came up with. And this was the first uh, video clip I saw out of four very different video clips from different films, uh, which isn't actually working. Never mind. No, I don't think that. You'll have to use your own imagination and mental imagery there. But it was a, a scene from ancient Greece. It was kind of a scene of a, uh, I don't know, some Greek hero fighting a minotaur. And so I was kind of quite compelled by that. Um, I'm not going to go through all the kind of the cherry picked kind of. Um, uh, examples, but there were a number of examples which were very compelling, um, which I can give you more details on. Anyway, ultimately, I've got a higher hit rate than was expected by chance. So the chance hit rate would be 25%. I got a 40% hit rate. Uh, that's not the results, that's uh, the next study, and uh, which was significant. I then repeated the study with some volunteers and said myself, um, who were under the influence of LSD at the time. They were mostly, thank you. Oh, here we go, that's a bit better. They were mostly uh, um, PhD scientists from Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, that was on a kind of sample pool uh, because it was a creative problem solving study with LSD, but we also sneaked in this precognition experiment on the back of it. And um, they uh, managed to get, uh, so they did a condition where they were not on LSD, uh, in a blind condition and a condition with on LSD, and they did the same precognition task, but one trial each, not 20. And uh, the results of that were that they got a significant result, a significant a beyond chance result in under the influence of LSD. The weird thing is, it was in the complete opposite direction to anticipated, i.e. it's what we call sign missing. It's instead of getting a, a kind of choosing the target, as the one most like their mental imagery, they actually rated the target as the least like their mental imagery, but consistently, so that became a significant result. And so what we call a sign missing effect. It shouldn't be significant either way, really, under this protocol. Turns out 
Um, I'm going to go into that, but it turns out there were some personality correlates related to that in that those who scored uh, worse tended to be high in neuroticism, high in introversion, and low in openness to experience uh, very significantly. Um, and basically, they were good scientists. Uh, they were neurotic, introverted, and uh, a bit shy, let's say. Um, and it turns out those conditions, at least two of those conditions, have been shown in previous parapsychology research to be related to better uh, size scoring in experimental trials. It turns out, though, there is a, there is a, a remedy for being a good scientist, uh, and that is psilocybin, because it changes all of those personality dimensions in the opposite direction. Uh, anyway, I then decided to not use scientists again as participants because they slightly screwed up my experiment. And we did uh, a field study with, with DMT with um, 20 participants. They all smoked DMT. It was a non-DMT trial and DMT trial randomly ordered uh, a same precognition design. And um, I could give you some uh, cherry picked results of that. This is just one of them then. So this was Somebody said she saw 3D hexagon, which I could see from the outside and also from the inside. Inside there were cell organelles and DNA strands. And this is a, just a, a screen grab from, from the video. It's basically an animation of DNA splicing. And that experiment, again, sorry, was a significant uh, difference between the non-DMT and the DMT condition in favor of um, precognition under the influence of DMT. So that's the research I've done so far. I'm not going to say it's conclusive, but it is kind of like at least a proof of process that you can actually do this research and uh, get significant findings. So I think I've pretty much run out of time. Thank you, David. Uh, we now move to Michael. Okay, well, we'll just see how it goes. I have to put a clock on it, but I thought that was a pretty interesting presentation as a proof of process. I like that very much. Uh, that is, David, I think you've set up a way that it could be tested in the future with larger ends, which is absolutely needed, and maybe tighter controls as you go along. Now, just to double check, you guys can still see me and hear me, right? Because the screen is frozen. I can't see you guys moving. Yeah, you're working just fine. Yeah, you're just working yeah fine. okay. All right, good. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, uh, a few comments there. I'll, I'll just comment on, on that and then make some more general observations. Um, it, again, I, I, I like the idea of using uh, microdosing for treating severe depression, PTSD, addiction, and so on. I, I think it's almost criminal that the government uh, outlawed these early experiments from the 50s and early 60s. And by the late 60s, it was pretty much shut down. Uh, I think for largely moralistic, religious, political reasons, not for really any good medical reasons at all. And I think we've lost half a century of what would have been really good research. So I'm glad you're doing that. And you know, some other people are doing that now. I think that's important. Uh, that doesn't really get us to the epistemological question of the nature of reality of what's going on with these drugs. But hey, if it helps people, you know, I don't care, <laughs> whatever it takes. Uh, if the truth in their mind is that their depression lessens, their PTSD goes away, whatever anxiety resides, then that's good. That's good. Whatever is going on in the brain, um, whatever works is fine. But of course, we do want to know, uh, say, for example, can a shaman under the influence of, I think in this case, you said it was a DMT maybe, or, or peyote, where he read the, he, he sort of uh, gave details about the son of this um, person he was working with, right? And, and then the person said, yeah, those things are true. How did he know this? Okay, maybe telepathy or something like that. Um, well, that's a testable hypothesis, right? But as you pointed out with the Zener cards, the reason those are so simple is because in you know psychological research, we need a really clear operational definition of what it is we're measuring. So it can be done by anybody in any lab um, and not be subject to openness about the uh, hit criteria. So the Zener cards are unmistakable. It's, it's a wavy line, it's a circle, it's a square, it's a star, whatever. And, um, and so I like that, that protocol and, and, you know, the problem with the shaman giving details about a person is you end up with something like a cold reading or a warm reading where 
they don't have to cheat. They don't have to have a hot reading where they actually know something about the person ahead of time. Um, they can just speak in generalities and the person listening will uh, just actually do the reading. That is, remember the hits, forget the misses, feel like it was an accurate reading and so on. So we have to get around all that. So the protocols you set up clearly are designed to, to get around that problem. Um, so I, I like that a lot. Um, and as you pointed out correctly, uh, you know, the research is pretty mixed in this field. It's been going on for over a century. I mean, it was the 1890s that the psychical societies, one in the UK, one in the US, started their serious research in, in, in which they tried controlled experiments under the criteria that you talked about and I just mentioned. And, and you can go through their published data and it's pretty mixed. I mean, there are some statistically significant experiments, but they're hard to replicate or they, they fail to replicate. You know, here I'd recommend to listeners to check um, Susan Blackmore's books on this subject. Susan um, is a PhD experimental psychologist. She went into this totally believing in the paranormal. And by the way, unlike me, she actually has tried a lot of these things. And so she knows what the experience is like, and she's still skeptical because, you know, the data is, is just not really there. And, and of course, uh, just speak more generally here for a moment, the um, so-called replication crisis th that began around 2010 was in fact, that, that affects you know, a lot of psychological research, especially priming research in, in cognitive psychology and some of the social psych experiments and also medical research uh, where, um, you know, some significant percentage, maybe half of all published papers uh, can't be replicated. So it, it's possible they should have never been published in the first place. Uh, there was some p-hacking or file drawer issues going on there, you know, and the, and the one that launched that was Daryl Bem's famous experiment, Feeling the Future, in which he sat subjects down in front of a computer screen and, and on the, co the computer screen would be split and, and an image was gonna pop up and the subject would just psychically guess or whatever they thought they were doing by pressing one key or another key of which side the computer of the computer screen, the computer would show uh, either a neutral image or an erotic image. And they did slightly better than chance at a statistically significant level. And this was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, very prestigious peer reviewed journal. And Daryl Bem was a very is a very highly regarded, respected um, experimental scientist. So you know that 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 met a couple of the criteria that skeptics have been throwing at uh, paranormalists. That you know you guys need to publish in respectable peer reviewed journals and run a real lab and real experiments. And okay, so so he did that. And uh, but then you know it wasn't long before people tried to replicate it. Um, uh, Richard Wiseman and um, uh, uh, Richie, um, sorry, his name's escaping me now, uh, tried to replicate this, uh, Stuart Ritchie, and, um, and they submitted it to the same journal, they failed to replicate, and the journal said, we're not interested in fail failure to replicate studies, it's like, that's bad, that's bad for science, you know, we need to know the failed experiments, and, you know, since then, uh, people have gone through BEMS protocols and showed that, you know, there was something of a file drawer problem, you know, that is, he was reporting the significant results, but not the insignificant results. And there was some, some cherry picking of the data and a few other methodological issues about what constitutes an, an a, a erotic image versus a neutral image, a little subjectivity there, although he used a database for that. And anyway, but the point is that um, that has failed to replicate. There are claims that it's been replicated 90 times or whatever it, it, you know, in a, this meta-analysis, but when you really drill down on that, it, it's pretty shaky. It was published in a non-peer-reviewed journal, uh, just one of these sites that anybody can post on. So that was not good. Conducted by Bem himself, also not good. Um, you know, just the, you know, the kind of problems that have plagued psychology, and I don't mean to pick on the paranormal, you know, most of the priming experiments that... Um, that, that make for good TED Talks and are used by businesses. Uh, you know, like if you have a clean desktop, you're more like, likely to be the more organized, you're more generous, you give more money to charity and so on. Or people that stand at the top of an escalator versus the bottom of an escalator, give more money. Um, you know, if you hold a pen in your mouth this way versus this way, you'll find other people's uh, jokes funnier. Uh, if you hold up a glass of warm water versus holding a cold glass of cold water, you'll 
when you meet somebody, the, you'll uh, interpret them as being warmer in personality if the glass of water you're holding is warm. You know, the, the, the power pose, Amy Cuddy's famous power pose of women stand up there with their shoulders back and, uh, you know, in, in a very confident pose, they'll, they'll increase their testosterone and get and more likely to get the raise when they go into the boss and, you know, all this, none of these things have replicated, right? So it's not just the paranormal, but it was BEM's experiment that kind of launched that problem. And then now uh, is a kind of corrective uh, a lot of the research is being posted ahead of time. That is, you have these sites where you post, this is the experiment, these are the experiments I'm going to run. Here's all 10 of them. And I will report the data on all 10, not just the one that I that I found. And 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 here's all of the data, not just the selective data. And you know, things like that I think is a good idea. And and certainly the paranormal would uh, research would benefit from something like that. So, and obviously, David, you know, I mean your your 40% hit rate, well, it's an N of one. You know, it's hard to say much about that either way. Uh, I'm not closed off to the idea of there being the, a paranormal, but let's let's think for just a moment about that word. You know, we use language um, purposefully, and it carries a lot of uh, information with the words that you use. So, uh, for example, we use the word mind and brain rather interchangeably, as if they're two different things, because it sort of feels like our thoughts are floating around up there separate from the brain matter, but, but, but there's no, in my opinion anyway, because I'm a monist, not a dualist, there's no mind, there's just the brain. The mind is just a word we're using to explain what the brain is doing. It's processing, it, that's, that's its mind stuff, but there's no mind, let's not reify that. And so I think of the same way of the paranormal and the supernatural, those are just words we're using as placeholders, linguistic placeholders for, you know, there's something mysterious going on, we can't quite figure it out. There's these anomalous psychological experiences like you, you, you discussed in your presentation um, and all over the world by many of different people and, and not just shamans taking hallucinogens, but you know, I know a lot of people that meditate a lot uh, who can have these kinds of experiences just through meditation. So there's clearly something going on. What is it? You know, okay, we'll call it paranormal or ESP or PSI, but those are just words. They don't explain anything. And the analogy I use is like when astronomers and cosmologists talk about dark energy and dark matter. They don't mean that as a causal explanation. They don't say, well, now we're done. We, 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 we now know what it is. It's dark energy. Dark energy and dark matter, those are just words. Those are linguistic placeholders until we figure out what it is. You know, it's neutrinos or it's brown stars or it's, you know, whatever it turns out to be. It, it, it's just a placeholder until we figure it out what's actually going on. And so the analogy I make is if, uh, say, for example, um, ESP uh, is real and we've figured out that the way thoughts are transferred from my skull to your skull, let's say it's two people reading each other's minds, or it's something like a uh, remote viewing where, you know, somehow the images from this other, the other room or the opaque envelope that's holding the, the object that I'm trying to get, you know, somehow the information is, is able to pass through my skull into my neurons to cause my neurons to fire. And I, I suddenly realize what it is that's, that someone else is thinking or whatever. Okay. There's no evidence for this at the moment, but let's, let's say that, 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 that there was, and that we figured out that it turned, in fact, it's linked to, to quantum physics because we know through the two slit experiment and, you know, there's all this weird spooky action at a distance where um, the somehow the subatomic particles are able to communicate with each other instantly across any distance. It could be 10 feet, 10 miles. It could be 10 light years. You know, it's just, it could be in another galaxy. Okay. How is this even possible? You know, and, it, and Einstein was so uncomfortable with it, he called it, you know, spooky action at a distance. Okay. But um, if, if, if that's what it turned out to be, that somehow the collapse of the wave function inside the subatomic particles in the, in the molecules of the, of, the, of the neurotransmitter substances, you know, leaping across the synaptic gap between my neurons somehow sent information to you 
you know, like in a quantum way through some quantum field, say, um, then that would no longer be the paranormal or ESP or psi. We wouldn't even use those words anymore. It would just be, oh, well, that's quantum consciousness, which is an actual term that some people use um, because they think there is something to this argument. You know, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hamroff famously have the theory about this um, theory to explain consciousness. And so something like information passing between two people or something it could be something like that well anyway my point is that first i don't think that that's a good theory of, of consciousness and i don't think their evidence is there for anything that needs explaining but i could be wrong so uh, but my point is that it if it was true and that was the explanation that would just become part of the natural world it would just be part of science we wouldn't need paranormal it would just be normal it wouldn't be supernatural it would just be natural and so I, that, that's why I go so far as to say there's no such thing as the supernatural or paranormal. It's just the natural, normal, and stuff we can't explain yet. You know, anomaly. So, you know, and that brings us back to where we are. Now, to construct a test, you know, I, I like what you proposed, and let's do more on that. There is, some, there is an experiment going on now with uh, ND, NDEs, near-death experiences, and out-of-body experiences where in hospitals where people are brought in, uh, you know, under great stress, heart attack, stroke, whatever, where they may report having had an out-of-body or near-death experience. And if they really are floating above their bodies in the OR, say, up, they should be able to see something up there that they couldn't see if they were down here. Something up there that the doctors and nurses don't know about and so on. And so there, there are a handful of places where um, these researchers have put objects up there at a, you know, on a shelf, you know, facing up. So you can't see it from down below. And so far, no one's reported seeing anything, but you know, that would be a good test. Um, and again, you'd have to be super careful to make sure there wasn't any shenanigans going on there or any leakage of information or any, any kind of, um, you know, just only reporting the hits and not the misses and, you know, is it statistically significant and so on. That, that would be a test. I would change my mind. I would say, okay, there's something going on here. I'm not committed. I'm a materialist, but I'm not committed to everything we know at the moment being the only explanations for things. But when it comes to something like back to Bem's experiment, feeling the future, um, uh, you know, the idea that um, that subjects, and this was Bem's conclusion, it, it was that it was a backward causality, backward causality, like, um, you know, sort of a precognition, like I knew what was going to happen before it happened. Well, we have four centuries of physics telling us that can't happen. It goes cause and effect. It doesn't go effect cause you know there's an arrow of time and that is pretty well supported i mean it is one of the most you know the second law of thermodynamics and so on uh the the chances of those laws of physics being incorrect or needing to be adjusted because there's this other thing going on is pretty low so we would say that's it would be an extraordinary claim and you know as sagan taught us uh, and made famous the ECRI principle, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, you know, that you better have a lot of evidence, not just this one experiment with a small N that no one can replicate. That's just not going to do it. And the reason it's extraordinary is because what are the chances that four centuries of physicists are wrong and that this social psychologist showing porn to college students in an experimental lab um, is right, you know, <laughs> and again, I, I don't mean, mean to sound flippant, but, you know, that's, that's the extraordinariness of this claim. I mean, four centuries of physics, we just spent billions of dollars at the CERN particle accelerator, and uh, they discovered no new physics. There was, there's nothing in there like, oh my God, we found this fifth fourth that we didn't know exists, and so on. It's like, no, it's like, we, it, physics is pretty well worked out. No one's going to say we're done with physics. No, of course not, but but the idea that there's this extra force out there that explains psi or the paranormal, and it's released through these, um, these hallucinogenic drugs, it seems pretty unlikely. Uh, and so that would make it an extraordinary claim. We'd have to kind of set our Bayesian hit criteria pretty high uh, because our priors are that it's very unlikely to be the case that all of physics you know, is wrong and that, that, that there's this other force there. So anyway, that's, that's my thoughts on, on that. I do think, oh, I was I made a few notes here. Uh, Psy missing, I find that pretty interesting. 
Um, the fact that you use the big five personality dimensions is super interesting. Um, you know, that people who score low in openness to experience, so they're, you know, they're kind of closed off and they're shy, introverted. Uh, and what was the other one? They're uh, high in neuroticism. Um, yeah, I could see how that could affect their, uh, their performance on those tasks. I'm not sure what it means in terms of psi missing. Uh, I guess you would argue that uh, it's the, the effect is so subtle, you have to be really open to it or else you're going to miss it. Um, and so that I'll just make one final point then, and then, and then we can go back to this conversation that, that is to say, if the, uh, another uh, thing is that if these effects were real, that people really could anticipate the future, even by just seconds, you know, precognition, if this was true, uh, we would live in a very different world than we live in now. That is to say, and here's the analogy I use, um, you know, if you, uh, you know, um, Trading companies, Wall Street trading companies, they go to great lengths to hack the market. Just, just, he, he just have a, just a fraction of a percent of an advantage over the other investment houses and and, uh, and and the other hedge fund managers and so on. They'll do anything. I mean, they even move their offices closer to where the the information's coming so they can get the information about excuse me stock trades just you know milliseconds before somebody else does. And so if you had even the tiniest of effect, that is to say, you could like BEMS protocol, you could set subjects in front of a computer screen and, and, and let's just say it's the Tesla stock price going by second by second and it's going up, it's going down and you know, these stocks, they fluctuate by the second. And if you could get an advantage, like if you could tell one second or even a millisecond ahead of time, if the stock was gonna go up or down and place the trade, because these companies can place these trades in milliseconds, you know, you could make just million, hundreds of, you could make billions of dollars in the stock market and with, with all the different, uh, you know, Apple and Google and all the different Netflix and so on, all the different companies. And if you just set up a, a team of people in front of computer screens and have them, you know, buying stocks and selling stocks microsecond, milliseconds before um, everybody else knows what it's going to do, there would be a huge advantage. Not to mention, going to Vegas and anticipating what the slot machine is going to do or which card is going to come up next. You know, if, if that's the world that, that was possible, we would know about that. There would be people doing this <laughs> and because companies spend, you know, they, they spare no money to gain just the tiniest of advantages to make money in the stock market. So if anybody was actually able to do this, I think we would know about it by now. Anyway, that's my final comment there. Thank you, Michael, for providing your response. Uh, now we go to David Luke for uh, five minutes respond and also providing your concluding statement for the implication of your research on the nature of consciousness. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Uh, I'm glad you uh, like my experiments and uh, at least uh, is supportive of them in, in principle, if we can scale them up. Uh, I maybe kind of rushed through it a little bit. There was one N of one study that was the kind of first one, and there were two later studies with one with 13 and oh, then yeah. 20 participants. Uh, the one with 20 participants also found about 40% hit rate. But yeah, mm. it's still, mm. uh, you, you point out some really important things about um, the nature of like doing good science and that replication is key. And, and these are just as much as anything to show that this can be done, this research, and, and unfortunately hasn't been done much of them by myself and some people in the 60s. And it'd be really nice to see people replicate it uh, and see what results they get as well. Um, but you, you, you're tapping into some of the important things and I'm glad you brought up you know, issues of failure to replicate, which be leakers, be devils, uh, all, of, all of science, particularly human science and psychology, um, a lot of that to do with underpowered sample sizes. Uh, and, you know, you say how uh, parapsychology has mixed results, but all, all kind of human science has mixed results because uh, humans are complex things. And a lot of that is to do with <laughs> kind of underpowered sample sizes. Uh, and that's why meta-analysis is used. And uh, meta-analysis was one of the kind of, kind of methodological advances pioneered by parapsychologists, actually, uh, as were double blinds and randomization, uh, placebo controls, uh, and pre-registration of, uh, of, of studies, and also, as you pointed out, uh, publishing null results. In fact, the Journal of Parapsychology is encouraging the publishing of null findings since the mid-80s, 
uh, I think they were pretty much very much pioneering in that regard in science. Um, and actually a recent paper by Axel Cardenia in uh, American Psychologist reports on 10 meta-analyses for parapsychology, all of which were uh, hugely significant, uh, but with you know, particularly small effect sizes. So 10 different types of parapsychological research, study research, looking at telepathy and clairvoyance and that kind of thing, remote viewing, uh, presentiment, that all the meta-analyses, all 10 of them are hugely significant. So it, of course we have mixed uh, findings and that's why we have meta-analyses. Um, um, and your, your point about publishing in respectable peer review journals, that is, it, it's a bit of a kind of catch-22. Unfortunately, in parapsychology, I'm on a parapsychology forum with Nobel Prize winners, and, you know, the, the amount of times parapsychologists say, I submit this paper to a journal, and uh, the, the editor won't even send it out for review. So it's it's a kind of catch-22. Yeah, yeah. And there's only people like Daryl Bem, who's been publishing in Psychological Bulletin and uh, personality and social psychology for decades have managed to kind of mm -hmm. sneak one in under the radar so it, 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 it's a, it's a kind of like we're caught in the in the kind of the the sociological aspects of science unfortunately in that there isn't funding because you can't publish in peer-reviewed journals and you can't publish in peer-reviewed journals because there's much funding and it's taboo and et cetera, et cetera. but i think the meta-analyses do speak for it um but a more kind of just focusing on on i'm not talking about psychology at large essentially, but rather just my own studies, I think uh, that they are not certainly conclusive. Uh, I'm just putting them out there as a, a proof of process that this research can and, and should be done. And, and it's the kind of question of why aren't scientists doing this kind of research, well, apart from the fact it's double career suicide, or at least singular career suicide now. I mean, actually, I've still got a job, which is astonishing. But just putting it out there that, you know, this science can and, and should be done. And I think, you know, it behooves us to uh, to seek truth and, and not only ask the easy questions about, uh, you know, human experience and the nature of reality, but also ask the, the difficult questions, which will might make you somewhat unpopular in your department. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your input on that, Michael. So now we move to uh, five minutes for Michael to provide his objections or uh, and his concluding statement to, to uh, David. Oh, Bruce. well, we don't, again, have to put a clock on it. It's just nice to have a conversation about this stuff, which we've been having. I think in general, I'm totally open to the idea, of course. I mean, uh, I've spent my whole adult career studying uh, the paranormal, the supernatural, religion, uh, psychological anomalous experiences that people have written about my own. So, I, you know, I'm open to it. Question is, what does it represent? How can we get to a causal explanation of it? It's possible, as you said, David, that, you know, the human condition is so complex, particularly the brain. Um, you know, it may be a long time. You and I may be long gone before this is all figured out. I mean, there's much said about, written about uh, altered states of consciousness, but we don't even have a, an accepted theory of consciousness yet. And, um, and so how can we have an ex accepted theory of altered states of something we don't even understand, right? So uh, I think we have a long ways to go on that. I mean, I've had a number of guests on my podcast talking about the hard problem of consciousness. And, oh, my gosh, there's like 20 different theories floating around now, serious scientific theories. And, you know, I think it's going to it's a hard, pro hard problem. So we're going to could be a while. And uh, so we may not fully understand what altered states even means. Uh, when we use those words until we understand what a non-altered state uh, means and how we explain that uh, through neuroscience and so forth. So, you know, let's move forward. <laughs> and as I said at the beginning, um, you know, to whatever extent using these kinds of mind-altering uh, chemicals helps people, that's also good. Again, PTSD, severe depression, anxiety attacks, things like that. If, if these things help, in addition to cognitive behavior therapy and meditation and these other uh, tools that people are using now, then use them all. And I'm pretty libertarian when it comes to drugs, you know, just keep the government out of it and, uh, or just regulate it, let people use what they want and try different things. And, and just, uh, you know, instead of spending on the money on law enforcement and imprisoning people, spend it on rehab and, and figuring out how, uh, you know, people, people can use these things constructively rather than destructively. But anyway, that's a that's another topic. <laughs> so uh, so I say go forth, sir, and and keep it up. 
Thank you, everybody. Uh, now we move on to questions to the audience. Um, maybe I can just pass, pass the mic to you. Can do you want to pass the mic? Hello. Okay, great. Thanks, guys, for coming. This was a really interesting conversation. I first want to uh, thank Michael for being even-handed and non-combative. Often debates are made to be about winning rather than getting at the truth of the matter. Um, and, you know, I would also like to say we at the Oxford Psychedelic Society, louder, okay. we at OPS would like to encourage you to try psychedelics at some point. And <laughs> if, if you would like access, I'm sure somebody around here can mail you some here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I have a two-part question. Um, the first is uh, about an interesting documentary that I saw recently, which is called Third Eye Spies. It's about two researchers at the Stanford Research Institute, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, uh, and they were funded by the CIA to study remote viewing. They're PhDs in physics with impressive backgrounds, and they claim that their results were highly re replicable for remote viewing, and that the CIA and the Soviets created large remote viewing programs and these researchers and others went on to dedicate their careers to this line of research. So first question is, you know, what is your take on these various government programs to work on ESP? Yeah, I'm familiar with the program, of course, uh, in, in addition to the missile gap uh, that the Americans were worried about, there was the psi gap that maybe the Russians were getting ahead of us psychically. Well, if they were, I don't think Putin's been putting it to very good use about how Ukraine would uh, respond to his invasion. He needed a little more psychic uh, telepathy and precognition on that one, I'm afraid. Uh, and so, well, the CIA ended that program, I, I think, because it, it didn't really work that well. First of all, they didn't spend that much money. I mean, skeptics made a big deal about, uh, you know, the millions of dollars spent, I think several tens of millions of dollars, which is nothing by a government program uh, standard, nothing. I mean, it's like the amount of fuel in a single aircraft carrier one, on one day flying sorties of jets, it's nothing, right? So, um, and, and they, you know, they sent me their volumes. There's multiple, the really thick volumes I have in, at my office of all the reported um, experiments they ran. And yes, they claim that they got some results. Well, maybe that's the debatable part. I mean, Ray Hyman is the kind of go-to guy. He's an uh, experimental psychologist who studies methodologies and he's written quite a bit about um, the Stargate program and, and more broadly on remote viewing and the problems, methodological problems it has. Um, but from a practical point of view, as I said, you know, living in the real world, if this stuff was true, what else would be true? And if, um, you know, the, if the remote viewers were really giving useful intelligence to the CIA, for example, of where the Russians were, you know, say, uh, hiding their missiles, uh, with nuclear tip missiles or where the terrorists were hiding, this sort of thing, then they would use it. I mean, th the program would still be going <laughs> because, again, the CIA spends, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to try to get any kind of intel. I mean, they're hacking our phones and, you know, using all that metadata, uh, you know, and a lot of it pretty questionably the way they're doing it. But the point is that, you know, if, if this stuff were true, if remote viewing were really possible, and the CIA could really employ some of these people to get intel, like where is the next terrorist attack going to be and who's going to do it? Or, you know, back in the, in the 2000s, where is Osama bin Laden? You know, that, you know, we knew he was in Tora Bora, but he, he slipped away from our uh, troops there. You know, why didn't the remote viewers or whoever, you know, if they were, well, they weren't in business by then anymore because that program ended in the 90s. But, but something like that, if, if they really could do that, well, we would be using them. The program would be red hot and hugely funded, uh, but they're not. They're not telling us any useful information. So that tells me it's probably not a real effect. Yeah, I would just um, rebut that perhaps the CIA is not being completely truthful with us on every matter? Well, <laughs> that's of course possible. Uh, government agencies really do lie to their citizens, but that doesn't mean whichever one you think they're lying about is, is, the, is, is, the, is the right one. The ufologists, UAP people, they say the same thing, you know, because when I ask them, well, where's the evidence? You know, where, where are the actual spacecraft and alien, well, the government's 
uh, covering it up. Well, we asked them, well, of course they lied. They lied, they, they lied as citizens. Yes, but they do, that's true. But that doesn't mean they're lying about that particular one. And as we know, people have been asking US presidents, both Obama and Clinton, you know, if there really were aliens at Roswell, would you tell us? And they go, yeah, we, I would tell you. Of course, they could be lying, but you know, again, <laughs> you know, there has to be some way to get at it. Sure, okay, cool. Well, uh, final question. So you've done a lot of research on trippy concepts, and I'm curious whether you personally believe anything that is outside of the conventional received wisdom or the apparent scientific consensus. There are many cases in which the dominant paradigm is false, including the dawn of the field of quantum physics itself, which you were just discussing, where Einstein famously was skeptical, saying that God does not play dice with the universe. In most fields, many new ideas are heavily resisted by the orthodoxy by default. So put another way, what are your personal views on any dominant paradigms that may be false, but are not yet recognized to be false by the orthodoxy? Or is the standard menu of received wisdom largely correct in your view? Yeah, that's a really good question. You're really getting at kind of the philosophy of science and, and epistemology. How do we know it's true? Uh, so most of us, most of the time, don't know much about anything. Right. So if you take climate change, you know, I, I think climate change is real. I think anthropogenic global warming is, is happening. How do I know that? I'm not a climate scientist. What do I know? I don't read the journals. I don't read the papers. People send me these papers. They're pretty complex. A lot of mathematical equations, computer models. I don't know anything about that. So I kind of rely on the experts in the field who, who themselves do understand do read those papers and compete with each other and argue with each other and debate each other such that when we reach a, when the scientists in a field reach a general consensus, never hundred percent of course, but some massive general consensus, X is probably true. The big bang probably really happened. And here's the evidence The theory of evolution is probably true. Here's how we know and so forth. You know, the regular person like me and you who don't work in those fields could go, yeah, Okay, that's probably right. The consensus is probably right. Provisionally true. Maybe they're all wrong. Maybe the 97% are wrong and the 3% are right. Probably not, but it's possible. So we never say, you know, the conventional wisdom is true. No, no, no one would really say that, or at least they shouldn't if they study any history of science at all. Uh, but uh, again, that, that kind of social nature of science, it's competitive, you know, that kind of open peer commentary and review process, albeit not perfect, is at least better than anecdotes or better than argument from authority. And, um, and so while it's true, some particularly social science theories tend to, economic theories tend to come and go pretty quickly. You know, it's, it's unlikely that Newtonian mechanics slightly modified by Einstein is going to change in some huge way some dramatic way. You know, if you want to get a spacecraft to Mars, you're mostly using Newtonian mechanics with some slight adjustments of general relativity theory, I'm told. And so it's unlikely that there's going to be some dramatic new explanation. The theory of evolution is so well supported that, you know, of course, on the margins, you know, you, you tweak it here and there when you're trying to explain some particular thing. But overall, you know, natural selection, sexual selection, you know, these are pretty well established you know, quantum physics, you know, I'm told, you know, it's, you know, it's like the best scientific theory ever in terms of, you know, making predictions, running experiments, testing them and finding the results. And again, I think it's on the margins where you, you get these debates about, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, like Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics or this one or that one. You know, you can just look at the Wikipedia page and there's like 10 different interpretations of some of these experiments. But those are more at the kind of the philosophical or metaphysical level of discussion. I don't think anybody's saying, you know, the experiment they run at CERN is, is, is likely to, to not come out a certain way. You know, they, they can predict apparently with great accuracy or like the, um, you know, like the, the eclipse experiments that Eddington ran to test um, the bending of light that Einstein predicted. Well, that first experiment was not that clean. And if you read the history of that, it's a, it's a pretty telling thing where there was a little bit of the argument from authority by Eddington himself because it was cloudy at the location he was at. His data wasn't very good. And the data where he had another telescope set up to measure this bending starlight during the eclipse, it was better, but that data was uh, you know, kind of right in between what Newton predicted and what Einstein predicted. 
wasn't quite clear. Now, since, since then, we know from other ex experiments, Einstein was right and Newton was wrong. Uh, but that's that. Eventually, we do figure it out, and uh, so I, I I tend to go with the consensus because I know how the scientific process works, but always keeping an open mind that you know that of course it could change. You know that they could, they could be wrong. You know, that's possible. Anyway, it's kind of a Bayesian argument. You know, putting setting a probability. You know, based on your priors, here's what we know at the moment. If new information comes in that forces me to update my priors and therefore my credence in the theory will change, then okay, that's that. That's how we should think about it. If you want to provide a quick response. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Michael. I, I can see that you, you seem to take the orthodoxy on there, just following up on that question. And <clears throat> very much viewing it from position of the history of science by looking backwards and saying, everything that we did discover is true. Uh, but I've no idea about what may be coming next or what is currently unorthodox but might become orthodoxy. So you're, you're, you're looking, you know, you're driving forwards looking in the rearview mirror. So no wonder you have no belief in precognition, uh, which is about looking into the future. <laughs> I hope you're making a joke because that's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yes, well, again, I mentioned consciousness. Um, you know, I, I'm now leaning toward Anil Seth's uh, thoughts on this, that it's probably the wrong question, and the question will just go away once we understand all of the processes at work in the brain. And his analogy is that this is what happened with life itself. That is to say, a century or so ago, there was discussion about, you know, trying to explain the Elon Vital, the force of life. You know, what is it? Is it an energy? Where do you measure it? Where is it located? And eventually, once, uh, you know, physiologists and medical scientists and so on understood the operations, the processes of all the different organs in the body and the body itself and all the systems at work, then no one, everyone just quit talking about the Elon Vitel. It just fell out of use. There was no use for it. Again, it was just a word, it was just a linguistic placeholder. And he thinks that's what'll happen with the so-called hard problem of consciousness. We'll just stop talking about it because we'll understand all the processes at work. And we're not there yet. And again, I said, he just published this paper. He sent me, uh, it was like, there's like 20 different theories to explain uh, consciousness, you know, the global workspace and this, this uh, information processing system with some mathematical equations behind it, and on and on. There's a bunch like that. I, I mentioned uh, Roger Penrose, Stuart Hamroff's theory, and, that, and there's many more. So it, it's possible that it won't be that one of them rises to the top and, and the others fall out because that one's right. It could be we just quit at talking about it because it was the wrong question to begin with. And uh, there might be more like that, you know, that, you know, we just don't know. <laughs> and I think, you know, there's many great questions like that. I wish I could live 500 years so I could, I wish I could be cryonically frozen and brought back 500 years from now so I could see what they figured out. It's like, oh, that's what dark matter turned out to be. Ah, oh, we should have, we should have known that, you know, much like we look back to the 1500s ago, what were they thinking? <laughs> Can I just right. take you up on that, on that point, Michael, about uh, what Chalmers was saying about consciousness being like, uh, you know, Ilan Vital or, or, you know, the definition of life, because I, don't, I know, I mean, he's, he's a philosopher of, of, of kind of mind, you know, but yeah, we explained like life, we defined it by its functions of respiration, excretion, reproduction, all the rest of it. But what is, what is life, you know? we're not even sure what death is right how can we be sure what mm -hmm. life is uh and you know we have all the technical capability or chemical biological knowledge of creating life and yet we haven't you know nothing's ever been created from something that was dead nothing living has ever been created from anything that was not living you can't no one has yet made anything organic from anything inorganic like uh, raw chemicals uh, and as a well, Christians may Christ, oh, Christians may disagree with you on that. The, can I finish? Christians there's may disagree part, with you on that finish? for one person. Can I finish? Michael, you've been talking <laughs> long time. Can I finish? There's a part of us all that's been alive since the beginning of life, right? There's a part you came from the cells in your mother's body, which came from the cells in her mother's body, and so on and so on. Like you are only here. We are all only here through the dint of the fact that we've come through millions, billions of years of life. 
Uh, and just to say that life is really just respiration, excretion, reproduction, etc., is is a bit poor, I would say. And I think Chalmers is hmm. not a biologist, but he is alive, as far as I can tell. But so we should probably stick to consciousness. <laughs> uh, we move to the next yes. question um, from the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to focus on the point that the skeptic did brought up, and I would like to get and I would like to get a response to it. And this is the following: uh, parapsychology seems to be like the dog that didn't bark in Sherlock Holmes. So, if those things are true, I mean, so the context is that a racehorse left racing and the dog didn't do anything. And that itself was a clue that the dog didn't bark. So the question is, why don't parapsychologists find some open-minded rich people who are willing to invest in their projects and monetize their findings? I mean, the skeptic himself did mention that, for example, you could use it in Las Vegas. That is a bit of a flippant example, but I am sure that phenomena that are as earth-shattering as the one described, there can be found a way to be monetized. And I'm also sure, because there are a lot of eccentric, very rich people, that some of them would perhaps be willing to fund this type of projects. So my question would be, why has this not happened? And why is this also not the direction of parapsychology research? Instead of you know trying to publish something in a prestigious journal, just try to convince some very rich people to invest in your uh, idea for a business which is then going to make a lot of money. Yeah, okay. Um, well, there actually has been a lot of uh, very rich people who have funded parapsychology research. And usually what happens is they try and set up a department at a prestigious university, and then the funds uh, somehow get kind of redirected away. Uh, this happened numerous times in the past at Harvard, uh, in uh, Freiburg, in Germany. Uh, really huge bequeathments of millions of dollars of money uh, set up specifically for parapsychology research and then you know somehow the dean gets involved in the vice chancellor and and uh, that money suddenly becomes you know like uh, in Freiburg it was set for parapsychology research and the vast majority of it went into psychophysiology research uh, when they had a new head of uh, department come in so it, it does happen and uh, but you know parapsychology has been kind of rudely kind of, um, yeah, redeployed in many ways. And as regards to the kind of finding a, a way of making money out of it, uh, some people have attempted to do that. I can't speak too much about that research. There's a paper coming out where there's been a number of uh, kind of ventures into kind of uh, uh, silver markets and things like that, which have been, some of them weren't successful, but overall there was a lot of money that was made. We're talking a few hundred thousand dollars uh, I'm not sure that's been published as yet. So there has been some attempts at that. And just from my own particular area, which is psychedelics, is that Al Hubbard, if you're aware of who he was, he was like the Johnny Appleseed of, of psychedelics. And this is completely anecdotal, but he supposedly, uh, he was the one who kind of turned everyone on to LSD basically in the 50s and 60s. He went around to casinos and uh, he said under the influence of LSD, he was able to win a large amount of money. Uh, but what actually happened was, he got thrown out of the casinos when he started winning big. Uh, and he actually got banned from all the casinos in Las Vegas, apparently, by his own accord or his own account. So I'll leave that there. Thank you. Next question. If funding was no issue, um, could you tell us about some experiments you'd like to run? <laughs> if funding wasn't an option. If it was no issue. Yeah, right. Well, what about ethics? Do you have to worry about <laughs> okay, well, I was just sticking with the money so far. But, um, well, obviously, I'd like to see my own research kind of upscale. What I'd really like to see happen is uh, I've been exploring the notion of shared visionary experiences with psychedelics. So this is something people report a lot on ayahuasca. Uh, and I have this idea for an experiment, which we almost got to happen, but it's not quite happened yet. It might happen soon. 
uh, whereby you set up a dynamic where you have people having, say, DMT, uh, either in pairs or not in pairs, you have a kind of sham condition. Uh, and the idea is that people have the intention of sharing their, their trip experience with somebody else on DMT. And you can have them in kind of separated rooms close by. And then we also do brain scanning with them. We use kind of like, uh, you know, some really nice level, high level MEG. We also map the data from the occipital load. load. We put that through kind of machine learning algorithms where you can recreate the visual experience from the occipital load data. And then we've got various different ways of corroborating it, whether or not they did have some kind of shared visionary experience, because we can also interview them. We're going to get in kind of forensic uh, artists who can recreate whatever kind of crazy entities that you have to see in that state. And then we can kind of set up uh, test paradigms where people uh, independently judge the narratives, the sketches, uh, and also the kind of recreated um, kind of uh, machine learned videos of the occipital output. And we can also look at the brain activity. And we can do that in a sham condition where there is no other person and in a control experimental condition where there is another person. And then we can very easily see on what level people have a shared experience. Is it a psychological thing? Is it uh, something to do with the brain activity? Or are they genuinely having experiences beyond some kind of uh, psychological or neurological explanation of a shared conscious experience, uh, you know, transcending the kind of brain and mind, brain and body, sorry. That would be my first experiment. I've got a whole list of them anyway, but yeah, I'll start there. We've got time for one, maybe two more questions. Uri, do you want to? Do you, um, thank you um, for a very illuminating discussion. Um, I was wondering what, if you think that um, panpsychism could have an explanatory role in uh, this sort of phenomena that you've been discussing. That's an interesting question. You're, I'm not really... you're asking me that? Oh, Michael, you go first. <laughs> Give me a chance to think about that. Well, I don't know too much about that. I, I had Philip Goff on my podcast. He He's kind of the premier promoter of panpsychism. And he, he had some good arguments. He's got a good book about this. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the idea that consciousness is everywhere, um, you know, it's, it's a little general for me. How do you test that? You know, for me, there, there needs to be some, again, operational definition and we can actually measure something or else we're really stuck just doing metaphysics and philosophy, which is fine. But, um, but in the science realm where I operate, you know, we need to be more specific. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, if I can respond to that, I don't know about panpsychism uh, uh, as a kind of proof or, you know, as a, a theory of consciousness, but in terms of helping to understand psychedelic experiences, I think it's got some interesting mileage. It's certainly the kind of way people lean after taking psychedelics. There's a recent survey, actually, I just refereed, came out that kind of animistic kind of beliefs or beliefs about what other things contain consciousness increases across the whole level from you know mammals down to kind of insects and fungi and all the way to inanimate objects people tend to believe that after taking psychedelics they're more likely to believe that things other than humans have consciousness but also i think you could take i would i think panpsychists go quite far enough uh, i think we could maybe learn a little bit from indigenous kind of worldviews and and belts about uh, their perspectives on the psychedelic experience, which is is it is a bit more, more animist than panpsych. I think the kind of the distinction of panpsychism that okay, we we, we draw the line at, at kind of living organisms. It's like as it's slightly arbitrary, or or maybe that you know. Well, so as you know, kind of panpsych agrees to everything, but you know, can a plastic bag be conscious, for instance? You know, that's a kind of that's the one that one falls down on. And maybe in an animist worldview, it could, uh, but. I think the perspective that in Amerindian indigenous people tend to take is what's called perspectivism. That is, and this is a brilliant counterpoint to the scientific epistemology is that instead of like in science, we, we try to be as objective as possible, which is a farce because you can only have a kind of degree of collective subjectivity, right? There is always biases sneaking in, et cetera. So 
We can never have total objectivity, but that's what we strive for in science. We, we try to kind of desiccate and, and kind of distance and objectify everything to measure it and observe it. And that's how we come to understand things, right? But in Amerindian cosmology or, or, or kind of worldview, it's the complete opposite. You know by becoming. So you take ayahuasca and you turn into a tree or a serpent or a jaguar. And that's how you, you, you view the world. It's like, I understand the qualities of this other thing by becoming it. And it's kind of hyper subjectivity, really. You, you know, you, you try to become that very thing you want to learn from. And I think, I think we could probably do better science by just opening up our kind of, you know, ramrod of the buttocks kind of approach to objectivity in that, for instance, one of the participants in our recent creative problem solving study with LSD was a PhD biologist by the name of Merlin Sheldrake. And he was trying to study the relationship between fungi and plant that don't photosynthesize. And it seems like there's a parasitic relationship between these, these ghost plants and the fungus. Uh, so under the influence of LSD in our study, he turned into the fungus, right? And he grew inside the rootstock of, of, the, of the plant. And after three years of collecting data and trying to understand it all, it suddenly gave him a whole new perspective on it. Which you can read about in his book, and I won't spoil it for you. So we, you know, we're interviewing him and all these other scientists. And so, you know, did you get any insights? How was that? And he said, "Slimy." <laughs> and we're like, "Oh no, he's, he was completely useless. You know, what a waste of good acid." But um, it turns out when you read his book, it, it really changed the, the the whole way he thinks about biology because he's like, you can learn a lot more about understanding the nature of you know, complex ecosystems and other species by looking at it from a non-human centric perspective, by looking at it from the perspective of the other species. So I'll just throw that out there. You may have- um, All right, gentlemen, time. I have a hard out at two o'clock my time and it's 2.01, so I'm gonna have to say goodbye. Oh, okay, Michael, thank you so much for being here and joining us. Yep. Now, do I need to do anything when I say stop the recording? Thank you very much, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure and lovely to meet you. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <laughs> it's okay. We, we finished at the right time, and I think there was enough questions also to go around. Um, if there's one more question for David Luke, maybe David can also respond. Do you want to go? Um, you mentioned in the um, precognition trials um, that people who are more introverted uh, have less of a hit rate. Um, do you think that um, one could be kind of like too open to these kind of experiences and as a result they're kind of filling in gaps which you know, aren't really there? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure necessarily that kind of being too open to it, but I get the idea of filling in gaps and seeing things which aren't there. Uh, it's something actually that Michael is called patternicity, you know, this tendency to kind of see associations and things which don't necessarily exist, but it was actually the, 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 the term that comes before that was called apophenia, was created by a, a, actually a Nazi psychiatrist in relationship to schizophrenics, and it's that, this idea that you see patterns in apparently random data, and I say apparently random because we can never really know what is actually random. So the idea that you know you can see faces in clouds or whatever like that, uh, and yeah, definitely you know uh, there are some people have a greater tendency towards that kind of apophenia, you know, of seeing patterns and taking psychedelics and being in odd states, or uh, it seems to enhance that kind of uh, a tendency to see patterns, possibly in the absence of real patterns. It's hard to say whether or not there is a real underlying pattern in random seemingly random data though, because of what we know about chaos and randomness and order, uh, you know, the kind of chaos theory. So anyway, that's a whole other tangent, but you know, there is a tendency to, to see patterns of things. What I think was missing though, is at the other end of the scale, is the opposite of apophenia, the tendency to see patterns in random data, is the tendency of, 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 of kind of skeptics to not see patterns in, in apparently related data like 10 published meta-analyses showing that parapsychological results are genuine. And they go, no, 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 it's got mixed findings. Uh, you know, there's no pattern here. There's no discernible pattern or, or kind of evidence for anything 
uh, that kind of confronts my worldview. Uh, so I think, you know, at the other end of the scale of apathy, you know, I've called what we call randomania. And that is, uh, you know, that the, the universe is actually completely random uh, and especially parapsychology results. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you so much, everybody. It's five past ten. Uh, we've reached uh, the maximum time for the event. Thank you so much for being here. There will be merch uh, from the Psychedelic Society if you would like to buy some merch. And I reiterate again, if you'd like to donate to our PayPal, it's O-X-P-S-Y-S-O-C. Thank you so much again. <laughs>